Hey everyone, I made today's video because I know how important it is for chemistry students to be able to take an element and determine what its charge will be when it turns into an ion. Now this is one of those topics that doesn't just come up in one unit, but instead is scattered and applied throughout any chemistry course, so it's really important. We're going to start with some underlying concepts because I know this can be confusing, then we'll take a look at some example problems so you know how to apply this knowledge to different problem solving scenarios. Now I would consider that if you want to get the most out of this content, you should consider putting that cell phone away so this can be a distraction free session. Also, if you would like the video, I'd be really appreciative. Okay, if you're ready to get started, you're just a few minutes away from understanding how to determine ionic charges. What's up everybody? Welcome to Neil's not so boring world of chemistry. Let's go into the lab and take a deep look. So what are you going to need to know in order to understand the things I'm trying to teach you in this video? Okay, here are some background things I want you to make sure you have a handle on. Do you know where metals and nonmetals are on the periodic table? Do you know how to find the noble gases? Do you understand how to determine the electron configuration of an element? And finally, how about valence electrons? Are you clear and confident in how to know how many of those a particular element has? So if you can do all that, metals and nonmetals, noble gases, electron configurations, and valence electrons, you're going to be ready to understand this video and determine ionic charges. But if you need a couple minutes to refresh your memory on those topics, pause the video here and then come back in a few when you're ready. All right, I think we would all benefit from a quick recap of atomic structure basics. So let's take a look at this simplified lithium atom. Now I say simplified because it's drawn without any neutrons in the nucleus, and that's because they're not essential to this particular discussion we're having. Now what you'll notice is that lithium has three protons in the nucleus, and they're positively charged, and three electrons outside of the nucleus, and each of those has a negative charge. So this lithium atom is neutral, meaning for every positive charge, there is one negative charge such that the charges cancel out. Now all atoms in the universe, if given the name atom, are neutral. They have the same number of protons and electrons. So what is an ion? Well, in certain instances that we'll discuss later, the number of electrons can change. So that's right, it's not the number of protons that will change in order to create an ion. The protons are stable and locked into place within that nuclear structure. But the electrons are a little bit more flexible. Sometimes they can be lost and in other instances gained. So let's say this particular lithium atom was to lose one of its electrons. So if we erase this electron right here, what do we notice? Well, there is no longer a balance between positive and negative charges. Now there is an extra positive charge that will not be canceled out by that third electron. So we call this an ion of lithium. And we would say that because there's an extra proton, this lithium will have a positive one charge. So we can actually write that using this symbol. This plus one or one plus tells us that this atom has lost one electron and now has a positive charge. Now let's do a hypothetical scenario, which actually is impossible. You'll understand more about why that is later in the video. Let's say that this lithium atom was to gain a fourth electron. So let's just put one more electron outside of the nucleus. Now what do you notice? Well, once again, that balance, that neutrality between the positive and the negative particles has been eliminated. But in this instance, there's an extra negative charge. So this proton will be canceled out by that electron, and this one by that one, and this one by that one. But then there's an extra electron left over, which would give this particular lithium atom a negative charge in its ionic state. Now in reality, lithium doesn't do this, it doesn't become negative, but for now what's important is that you understand why shifting the number of electrons can make an atom turn into either a positive ion if an electron was lost, or a negative ion if an electron was gained. 
So you'll remember in the beginning of this video, I mentioned the noble gases, something about you needing to know what they are. Well, we're gonna use them right now. You can see that I've written them out for you on the board behind me. And of course, you can always find your noble gases in the 18th group or column on any periodic table. These elements are notable, special, because they have super low reactivity. In other words, they're really stable and comfortable being by themselves. Now, in nature and experimentation, we've noticed a pattern. Other atoms on the periodic table in our universe tend to actually want to be like or mimic the noble gases. That's right, atoms, whether metals or nonmetals, will gain or lose electrons in order to have the same electron configuration as the closest noble gas. Okay, but we have to look at that in some more detail. How do we know what the closest noble gas to a particular element is? Okay, let's say we're interested in potassium. If I was to say to you, what's the closest noble gas to potassium? Most of us instinctively look ahead to the right and we scan across the periodic table and we say krypton. And krypton actually seems like it's pretty far from potassium. But again, our instinct is to always look ahead. But we would be wrong. You see, when determining what the closest noble gas is, you've got two options. Sure, you can look across, but you can also look behind the element in question. So for potassium, which has an atomic number of 19, the closest noble gas is actually one row above it. It's argon with an atomic number of 18. Now, on the other hand, if I was to ask you what the closest noble gas to bromine was, well, in that case, you're certainly gonna just look ahead because right next to it, there's krypton, only one atomic number away. So it turns out that there's a pattern. All of our metallic elements, which tend to be on this left-hand side of the periodic table and also in the middle, they're always going to be closest to the noble gas behind them. So I have a little saying I like to remember. Metals lose a level. Metals lose a level. In other words, when you want to find out what that closest noble gas is, always go backwards to the previous level on the periodic table. Now, for the nonmetals, it's totally different because they're located on the right-hand side of the periodic table. The shortest path to a noble gas for those will always be going forward. So just like with bromine, we said it was krypton. For chlorine, it would be argon. For iodine, it would be xenon. So I also have a saying for the nonmetals. I call them nons. Nons add on. So I'll say it all together, and hopefully you can remember this, and hopefully it's helpful. Metals lose a level, nons add on. Metals lose a level, nons add on. Okay, let's take a look at some specific elements and use that phrase in order to come up with correct answers to determining ionic charges. So we're gonna walk through how to determine the ionic charge for the element aluminum. Now you can see here, I've drawn a modified version of the periodic table, really only the parts we'll need. It's just meant to replicate this third row on the table. And of course, there's this gap here between magnesium and aluminum, which is this big stretch of emptiness on the table, okay? Now, when we look at aluminum, we know that we have two choices. Aluminum is going to either want to be like the noble gas in front of it, which would be argon, or the noble gas behind it in the previous row, which is neon. And so we've got to figure out which of those two makes more sense. Now remember, our standard saying that we're gonna use is metals lose a level, nons add on. Well, aluminum is a classic metal. It's silvery, it's shiny, it's a good conductor. It's got all those properties that are indicative of metallic elements. So based on our saying, uh, it should lose a level, which would mean it's gonna to wanna to be like neon. Now we can also look at it another way. We can look at the atomic number of aluminum, which is 13. It has 13 protons in the nucleus and 13 electrons in the outside area of the nucleus, right? And we can ask ourselves, well, what is it closer to? 
Is it closer to the atomic number of argon, which is 18? Or is it closer to the atomic number of neon, which is 10? Because again, these elements are always going to lose or gain in the most convenient or efficient way possible. So they're going to want to do the least amount of work. So aluminum would have to gain five electrons to be like argon, or it could simply lose three electrons to be like neon, have the same configuration. So I think you'll agree with me that the most efficient way or path to being like a noble gas for aluminum is to lose a level. To lose the appropriate number of electrons so that it has the same electron configuration of neon. Okay, well how many electrons is that? Well, if neon has 10 electrons and argon has 13, it's going to have to lose one, two, three of its electrons. So now we need to come up with the charge of this ion. Now as we learned before, for every positive proton, that will cancel out the charge of one of the electrons. Now because this neutral atom has lost three of its electrons, when we look at the balance of charges, we still have 13 protons, but we only have 10 electrons. So there are three extra positive charges in the nucleus that don't have a matching electron in the electron cloud. So for aluminum, because it lost three electrons and now has three extra protons in the nucleus, we are going to say that its ionic charge is positive three or three plus. Okay, so I hope so far this video and concept is working for you. I think we should take a look at a non-metal example to really solidify your understanding. Now in this case, we're gonna take a look at oxygen, which is the eighth element found in the second row of the periodic table. And I've tried to replicate the first and second rows of the table on the board behind me. You can see that there is this gap here, which is just meant to represent this big space, okay? Now the saying goes, nons add on. Oxygen is a classic non-metallic element, okay? And it's probably something you should have committed to memory. Things like carbon and oxygen and fluorine and nitrogen and phosphorus come up a lot as non-metals. Now, if nons add on, I'm gonna expect that oxygen is gonna wanna add on electrons to have the same configuration as neon. And that's exactly what it does. But what if we forget that saying and we just think about it conceptually? What's the shortest, most efficient route or path to becoming like a noble gas for oxygen? Well, if we look ahead, it would only have to gain two electrons, right? But what about losing electrons, as some elements do, in order to be like the noble gas before it? Well, that would mean oxygen would have to lose one, two, three, four, five, six electrons to be like helium. So if we just think about what's easiest, the path of least resistance, oxygen will just gain two electrons to have the same configuration as neon. Now, of course, we have to actually determine what the charge of the oxygen ion will be. If we go to our model here, we're starting off with eight protons in the nucleus and eight electrons in the electron cloud. Now, if it gains two more electrons, I will have to add those to my model. And truthfully, you don't always have to have one of these drawings to get the question right. The more you do this, the more it becomes intuitive and you think about this using your brain. But when we add those two electrons, it disrupts the balance, right, of charges. We no longer have the same number of positive protons and negative electrons. So oxygen is not gonna be neutral at this point. Instead, because it's gained extra electrons, two of them, it's now gonna have two extra negative charges. So we represent that by saying the charge of oxygen as an ion is two minus or negative two. Those extra electrons it gained in order to be like neon disrupt the balance and outweigh the number of positive protons resulting in a negatively charged ion. So for as well as we think we understand this topic so far, there's still one scenario that we haven't yet addressed. If you were asked to find the ionic charge of carbon or silicon, you might find yourself confused. The scenario would play out like this. You'd remember the idea that atoms are likely to gain or lose electrons based on the shortest path to being like a noble gas. 
Then you go ahead and look at either of these elements, and when you start to look at the math, you notice that carbon has to gain four electrons to be like neon, but it could also lose four electrons and end up being like helium. So see, in these scenarios, there's no clear winner when it comes to the path of least resistance toward becoming like a noble gas. So what are we supposed to do? Well, what we find in nature is that elements like carbon and silicon that are equidistant from the two closest noble gases actually don't become ions. That's right, carbon and silicon as two prime examples will not tend to lose or gain any electrons. Now that doesn't mean that they don't do other interesting things in order to become more stable, but we'll talk about that in a different video. But for now, I just wanted you to know that if you're dealing with either of these elements, it's completely legitimate to argue that they don't form ions whatsoever because it's not easier or more difficult for them to gain electrons as opposed to losing them, so they don't do either one. Let's review some concepts that we covered in today's lesson. Atoms are electrically neutral. This is because they have the same number of positively charged protons as they do negatively charged electrons. When we use the word ion, we're referring to an atom that has either gained or lost electrons. And because of this, they have an electrical charge. Now why do atoms turn into ions? Well, it has to do with stability. More specifically, they want to have the same electron configuration of the nearest noble gas. So how do they do that? Well, we said that metal atoms tend to lose electrons while non-metal atoms tend to gain electrons. And we can summarize that with the saying, metals lose a level, nons add on. Here's a tip. Remember that when metal atoms lose that level, when they lose electrons, they will always become positively charged. Nonmetals, on the other hand, by adding electrons, will always have a negative charge. Okay, here's our practice question. Which of the following elements will have a charge of positive two after it becomes an ion? Please pause the video here and think through your solution and then continue watching to see my answer. I hope you selected magnesium. Firstly, the question states that this ion will have a positive charge. Now because metals lose a level, they will always be positively charged. Because of this, we can narrow our choice down to only A and B. Those are the only two metals out of the four possible options. Now the closest noble gas to magnesium is neon. And if you look on the periodic table, you will see that neon is two places away from magnesium. This means magnesium will have to lose two electrons to have the same number of electrons. And this is why it will have a charge of positive two. Thanks so much for watching this video and I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave them below.